Please welcome Larry Platt and Roxanne Patel-Shepilavi, the Philadelphia Citizen Co-Executive Directors. Um, if you were with us two years ago, Dr. Uh, Michael Eric Dyson uh, took us out on ideas we should steal with on a on a on a bed of sunshine and hope. Uh, and these are very different times, though. So many times during the, the last year, I've wondered what would what would Dyson say? And his new book, which is amazing, a tearjerker, and you can get it in our uh, uh, citizen bookstore thanks to our partner, Headhouse Books. So with that, let's let's yes, we'll put a link in the in the chat here. Yeah, we got a link in the chat. Let's bring on uh, 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 Dr. Michael Eric Dyson and Dr. James Peterson. Like uh, uh, Dr. Jill Biden, we are going to celebrate their doctorates uh, and 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 refer to them by their by their earned titles. Uh, and then Roxanne and I will come back uh, at the end. And and because it's live, we, we'll, we'll, we'll we'll take some questions. Put some questions in the chat or in or in the the Q and A. Right. Yeah. So let's get those guys up here. You guys coming? There's a little there's a little camera at the at the far right. Uh at the in the right. It looks like a video camera. Um, do you guys see it? Jonathan, are you able to help them get on? In the meantime, uh, while we're waiting for for that to happen, uh, let me give a plug to Dyson's book, Long Time Coming, which is very cleverly, con con the conceit is around open letters to martyrs of this re racial reckoning moment. Um, and I found it both insightful and moving. And there's, there's that beautiful bald head, <laughs> uh, Dr. Peterson, and we'll have Dyson momentarily, I guess, huh? Yeah. Oh, oh, there he is. Great. Right, we we're... will lead you guys to it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, almost there. Uh, there, there you are. There you are. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, uh, don't only have one bald head. <laughs> Three. Thank you, Miss Roxanne. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. You said yes, just one. <laughs> all right, thank you. All right, all right. We'll see you guys soon. Yeah, thank okay. you so much. Okay. We, we were a long time coming with the technical challenges. <laughs> <laughs> but we are, we are, we are here. And uh, I also want to thank Larry and Roxanne and the entire team at the Philadelphia Citizen because, uh, you know, Philadelphia Citizen is an incredible platform in terms of bringing folks together to have conversations. Uh, about great work like this. And so I'm humbled and honored to be able to be here. And as always, Dr. Dyson, I am humbled and honored to be in conversation with you, good sir. Thank you, sir. Just call me kiddo, please. Just call me kiddo. <laughs> kiddo Dyson. <laughs> kiddo Dyson. <laughs> just just because after, after Mr. Epstein uh, went in on Dr. Biden, Jill Biden, it's so disrespectful. It's patriarchal. It's condescending. And this dude don't even have, not doesn't even have, don't even have a doctorate. So what you hollering at, homie? You don't even possess what you're trying to dispossess her of. So I yeah. don't know. It's a strange situation because I feel like um, I feel like there's there's different stakes at play for women mm -hmm. and people of color who have PhDs. And so right. You know, maybe there's too many white male PhDs, but there are not a lot of PhDs who come from where I came from. And, and, and from the hood where I came from, ain't a whole bunch either. And you're a two PhD household. You, indeed. Dr. Peterson, Dr. Peterson. Indeed. You know? And your wife, as a, as a nurse, then went back to school to get a PhD. That's right. even more extraordinary. That's it even is. more extraordinary. It is. Shout out to Dr. Belinda Waller-Peterson. But listen... Uh, we're here with, with a mission here. Uh, this is the book, Long Time Coming, Michael Eric Dyson, Reckoning with Race uh, in America. And Doc, you know, I have a ton of questions. We don't have a ton of time. Um, and, and so I kind of want to start at the beginning. And, I'm, and the questions I'm going to ask, these are structural questions. That's how my mind works. You know that um, I'm always in conversation with you. So I have the opportunity to see how these 
how these ideas germinate and how they unfold. And so um, there are some spoilers here, folks. You still buy the books. It's, it's extraordinary. It's, it's an extraordinary narrative and 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 really uh, an extraordinarily well detailed sort of criminology uh, of black death at the hands of law enforcement in this country um, um, over the last several days. <clears throat> Um, but, but Doc, so I just want to begin at the beginning. The structure of the book, it, it's in the epistolary form. This is a series of letters that you write. And my next question is about how those letters are structured. But, but can you share with the audience, you know, why you felt the epistolary form, why you felt like writing letters to these martyrs of the Black Lives Matter movement was the appropriate, most resonant approach uh, for 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 talking about the issues that you wanted to talk about in long time coming and reckoning with race in America. Well, <clears throat> first of all, Dr. Peterson, it's always great to hang out with you, my man. Uh, one of my longest conversation partners in my life, a co-conspirator on intellectual and literary matters. Uh, so you know, I mean, you see his fingerprints all over my Jay Z book. It wouldn't exist without uh, Dr. Peterson. In, in our conversation. So <clears throat> what an honor it is uh, to be here. I had to write letters because he wasn't available to hook me up on this one. So I had to just start writing to people themselves. You know, um, and I want to thank uh, uh, Miss Roxanne, Mr. Larry, uh, brother Larry, brother, uh, sister Roxanne for their extraordinary work. And then having an extraordinary writer like you writing with them is a beautiful thing. So if y'all have a choice between buying uh, the newspaper the Philadelphia Citizen or my book, Get the Philadelphia Citizen, you got so much coming at you. So for me, um, I wanted to write to as opposed to write about, right? Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to further objectify these figures and exploit them for book sales or for publicity, I really wanted to have a conversation with recently arrived ancestors to think out loud with them about the nature of the trauma that they endured and as a result that we endured, the way in which their martyrdom helped forward our own struggle. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you and I are involved in a project where one of the people has talked about going routinely to her grandmother's gravesite. Mm -hmm. And we've discovered a lot about talking to this subject about going to their grandmother's gravesite. Right. And I said, why don't I talk to the recently dead? Now they may think I'm kooky and, and it's hokey, but what I wanted to do, not in a spiritualized sense, but in a seriously engaged manner, I wanted to think out loud with Breonna Taylor, with Sandra Bland, with Hadia Pendleton, with Elijah McLean, with Eric Garner, uh, with Reverend Clemente Pinckney. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, to, to try to, to focus on the hurt, the pain, the trauma, the suffering, the grief that were the consequence of their deaths and to think out loud about why those deaths uh, affected us so profoundly and impacted us uh, so seriously. And so I thought the epistolary form of writing to them, writing out loud about what their lives were about, rehearsing the circumstances of their deaths so that the rest of America, myself included, would have to grapple with in both an existential and in a political fashion, at least a social one, uh, the meaning of their lives and, of course, the meaning of their deaths. Yeah, I want I, I really want to probe that with you a little bit more, um, especially how you how you put certain martyrs in conversation with other figures and other um, um, other concepts. But let's just I want to settle something before we even go go further, which is you are writing in a public sphere where the spectacle of black death is so prominent and has such potential to desensitize us to the loss of black life uh, so regularized in social media and through videos. You do wonderful sort of a labyrinthine study of, of screens and us watching black death and us being on Zoom and all the ways in which screens impact our lives. I mean, this, some of that stuff is just 
it's heady, but it's powerful. But how do you how do you reconcile your approach, which is, um, you know, this is the most detailed uh, sort of uh, black criminology of police brutality that I've seen around the contemporary moment. And so without trying to provide spoilers, you give very specific details about each situation that you chronicle over the course of the text. And in doing so, I'm just wondering, how do you how do you reconcile that? The, the specificity and detail and the explicit nature of the, of, the, of the stories that you tell in these conversations with these martyrs up against the challenge of the spectacle of Black death in the public sphere, in, in, in the world, and obviously in the United States? Yeah, it's a great point. It's a great question. Um, and the way you set it up is especially powerful because it does implicate me in the co-conspiracy of spectacle making, right? There's no way to avoid that. And at the same time, you know, I'm of a generation, you're a young man, I'm an old man, I'm 62 years old. And I come from a generation that has learned a great deal from Black Lives Matter, uh, from millennials, you know, even Gen Zers, Gen Xers, you know, the whole deal, right? And one of the things they teach us is about safe spaces, about self-care, about triggers and trigger warnings. All that stuff is foreign to me. I can't lie, right? So I've learned a great deal. But where I push back just a bit in this instance, and perhaps in others like it, is that if those people endured death, the least we could do is understand how they died. Right now, I've never heard it put the way you put it in terms of the criminology of black death. This is why you're James Braxton Peterson. And I'm out here hanging out with you, trying to learn what I'm talking about. I talk to Peterson so I can learn what I wrote so I can explain to others what I'm about. So that's a brilliant formulation about the criminology of black thanatopsis, about mm -hmm. black death. And so for me, you know, I'm saying I know a lot of people ask me, Oh my God, it's traumatizing. And if I do, I get a warning. They didn't have a warning. Without warning, snuffed out, shot. Look at my voice rising. Look at the temperature being escalated. Look at what I'm doing. Partly out of generation, partly out of emotional makeup, partly out of existential stakes. But I say, if they didn't have a choice, why is it that we sometimes the resort to safe spaces is an avoidance? of our responsibility to bear witness. And how are you gonna bear witness to something you ain't seen? Mm. How are you gonna bear witness to something you ain't heard? Mm. You can say it's generalizing, everything is particular. Mm. Every death is individual. Breonna Taylor is not Hadia Pendleton, who is not George Floyd, who is mm. not Eric Garner. Eric Garner is not George Floyd. And they both died saying, I can't breathe, but it's dramatically different. And unless you pay attention to the specificity of thanatology, to the particular means by which black mortality and the magnitude of black death and the consequent grief wow. that is engendered as a result of that occurs, I don't think you can be a good witness. And I have sworn to the God I serve and to the people I love to be a witness for the truth as best as I can. And in mm -hmm. this instance, I thought this was the thing to do without trying to sensationalize uh, but I do take the positive consequence of both spectacle and performance. Mm. I know it's a bet noir now to say performativity, performative uh, allyship and stuff and performative. I get it. But can I tell you, performance is critical to my life, critical to black folks' lives. And performative, of course, means you're just trying to show off and do it uh, in public spaces where, in a way you ain't trying to do it behind the scenes. That's one meaning. Mm. I'm not ready to surrender performance to that meaning. In fact, my next book has performance in the subtitle, and it's very prominent. So performance and spectacle. Mm. What do you think Dr. King was doing when he went to Birmingham and had a bigoted sheriff mm. who was killing, who was trying to hurt black people by washing them against the wall and sicking police dogs on them? Spectacle. Mm. So I think spectacle and performance are critical means to elevate the consciousness and deepen the awareness of black death in this instance.
That's a powerful uh, answer to that question. I appreciate it. Uh, for folks who just maybe just tuned in, this is the benediction in the closing uh, of the Philadelphia Citizen Ideas We Should Steal Festival. Uh, Dr. Michael Eric Dyson is uh, talking about his latest book, A Long Time Coming, uh, Reckoning with Race in America. Doc, I want to just get a little bit into the weeds. I'll pull back out because I think there's some great concepts we should talk about as well. But I want to get a little bit in the weeds here for a minute with the book, because <clears throat> for for each letter that you write, um, it's not just you in conversation with a particular recent martyr of the movement for Black Lives. Uh, you also put them into conversation with other figures. And so I need to use my note for this because this is a complex piece here. But so, for example, uh, in your letter to Emmett Till, you put Emmett Till's experience in conversation with Ahmaud Arbery. Right. Uh, in your letter to Eric Garner, you put Garner in conversation with George Floyd and vice versa, and Jake Blake and everybody else, right? Uh, right. For your letter to Breonna Taylor, though, and for your letter for Hadia Pendleton, when you shift to Black women, you open up the aperture in terms of the discursive conversation. So, for example, if, if for Emmett Till, you put him in conversation with Ahmaud Arbery or with Eric Garner, you put him in conversation with, with George Floyd, when you shift to Black women, you up the stakes a little bit because you put Breonna Taylor in conversation with slavery and the theft of Black bodies. Um, I want to talk about these specific concepts, but you don't have to answer this here, but you put her in conversation with the political economy of night. Uh, you put her in conversation with the black next and the white again, right? You 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 up the stakes for Breonna Taylor. Same with Habia Pendleton, where you, where you take the lens and turn it back on the black community to think about how black death and black murder operates in the black community, and you put Hadia Pendleton in conversation with cancel culture. Right. So, and I, and I'm not saying this is an intentional strategy. I'm saying this as as an analyst looking at the book, a reader looking at the book. With the men, you put them in conversation with other figures in the martyrdom uh, 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 panoply, right? Mm -hmm. But 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 with Breonna Taylor, with Dia Pendleton, you put them into conversation with large ideological and historical conceptualizations of blackness and resistance and oppression. Can you, was that deliberate? Is that just the natural framing of how a long time coming operates in your mind? But or was there some some other strategy that I'm not seeing how you how that shift occurred? between how you talk about some of the men in this particular context versus some of the women in this particular context. Brian, as usual, in your deconstructive praxis, uh, and Sandra... Uh, Sandra Bland as well. Sandra so Bland, you. in regard to the architecture of comfort and the degree to which I, white... I missed the note. Sandra Bland with white comfort and black exhaustion. I missed the note. I missed, sorry, I missed the note. Right. But but the women are in these because they bigger, because they better, because they're more omnicompetent. Because black women have been bearing the burden of black identity, and I wanted to signify that in both metaphoric intensity and passion, as well as comparative analysis between those black women and the forces against which they are pitched, and the black men, right? And I wanted to say, I'm not dissing anybody in that book, as you know. I love everybody in that book, and I try to show it. But what I'm also trying to suggest, however, is that while we know George Floyd is doing posthumous work, carrying the burden as a martyr in the same way that Brianna is and Sandra Bland to a degree, um, that Black women's work is infinitely bigger is larger, encompasses so much more because Breonna Taylor is comparatively linked to what? The entire sweep of slavery and the thievery, the, 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 the originating act of theft from Africa itself. So it doesn't even begin here. It's the act of thievery from Africa, the act of theft from Africa brought here on middle passages where millions were lost and then you know inscribed in the text of slavery this let's just call that nicole hannah jones uh, revenge <laughs> for people who are trying to diss black women talking about 1619 and you can explain who nicole hannah jones is uh after i finish so so call it the recognition that black women have borne the burden 
have carried the narrative, have fulfilled the trajectory, and have inspired uh, the comprehensive engagement with large forces that come through their bodies, translated through their limbs, mm -hmm. uh, in a way that even though black men are often given more credit for, after all, George Floyd dying on camera was a huge impact, and I'm sure we'll talk about that, or Eric Garner, I didn't want to reproduce the pathology of a patriarchal perspective that privileged the sight of their deaths in a way that was more immediately relevant and therefore more spectacular and more heroic than the women. And I'll give it, let me give you the parallel I had in mind. You can tell me if it works. So when you talk about black women and black men in terms of how they suffer, you know, with, uh, in terms of violence and stuff, where black men in public spaces, at crack houses, at places, quote, of ill repute, whatever criminal activity, underground activity may be taking place, and they're more likely to be caught there, more likely to be judged uh, by the jury of police on the spot and tried to be held to account. Mm -hmm. So it's more, it's more spectacular. It's more dramatic. It's more public, whereas women are suffering at home. They're doing their suffering at the domestic hurt and pain that they have to endure. Men coming home, beating the hell out of them, kicking the dog, beating the kids, whipping uh, against the wives, the domestic violence that they endure. It's been rendered invisible. Therefore, it can't be spectacular. Therefore, it's not seen as a propulsive energy that drives the reconstruction and transformation of black life. So I wanted to put a microphone on those hidden spaces that black women occupy and the large sheaths of history against which the canvases against which their lives are sketched to try to say, let's echo this, let's amplify this, let's just show the large degree uh, to which their suffering is, is almost rendered structural and systemic and is never seen as individuated and yet black women carry that burden. It's kind of you know, an arc, it's almost uh, esoteric, but you brought it out in such a brilliant and articulate fashion that, that helps me translate that. I hope it makes sense to people. It, de it definitely is getting across uh, to, to, to me as, as, as a reader. I hope that doesn't spoil it too much for folks. I just feel like you raise the stakes in how you engage women in the narrative structure of a long of long time coming and it, it, it's uh it's powerful in certain ways so i i want to talk about screens and technology for a minute because we're going to run out of time and i i still got to get a couple of the germ questions in too so um I, I want can you share with our audience how you're interpreting the interface between the pandemic uh the movement for black lives and the eruption around that movement and technology um, um, the existential analysis that you provide in the book about us being at home and us looking at screens and how that informs and shapes how we responded to the video of George Floyd, how it erases some of the desensitization that maybe we experienced in non-pandemic moments. But th those, those three things loom large, the pandemic, the movement for Black lives, and technology. They all loom large in long time coming. Can you explain how you wrestled with them? And, right. And maneuver your way around them in terms of articulating the stories of these extraordinary martyrs. Yeah, no, again, uh, it's a it's a great uh it's a great underscoring you're doing there. Yeah, I think I think uh, the technology was critical. I think the screens were critical. I think the fact that many of us who could afford to be home were home watching on our screens, right? That's the pandemic. And then what happened, what had happened was is that that being home on screens forced us to appreciate the paradox of remote intimacy, <laughs> right? Hmm. And intimate mediated through a screen. Usually that was the uh, uh, alienating force. Hmm. Uh, my God, why don't you young people put them damn cameras down and come talk to each other? I'm <laughs> sure I've said it. <laughs> why don't you put down the damn phones and learn to speak to each other. You're right in the same room and you're texting each other. Thank God we had been routinized <laughs> in that kind of behavior because look at what we're doing right now. Right. Right. Literally right now. Right. The, 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 the pandemic 
right? The pandemoptics, mm. right? That's what these are, pandemoptics, mm. the optical force of the pandemic. And the panopticon of Jeremy Bentham rendered differently here. I'm getting all nerdy for y'all who want to study Foucault and Jeremy Bentham, but it's pretty dope though, in terms of the panopticon and the pandemopticon, right? Mm -hmm. And the, pandem the optics of the pandemic, the way in which we see through the pandemic, mm -hmm. the way in which the pandemic provides a lens through which we view ourselves and literally the lenses on our screens, whether it's Zoom or some other, right? Like literally Zoom is what we do with the camera to zoom in or zoom out. Right. That becomes the brand name like Xerox. It's not Xerox. It's a it's a replica. It's a it's a reproduced copy, but the brand has become so identified with the process, the function that it's called a Xerox. Yeah. Right? That would be like some brilliant in interpreter of another person's book would be called a Peterson. <laughs> so the thing is is that here we are, right? Now with remote intimacy, we had become accustomed. Whereas two weeks before the pandemic, at the hell, the thing is buffering. Now we're grateful. Oh, just hold on, because oh, there, hey, hey, Granny, right. hey, 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 therapist, hey, yeah. hey, doctor, yeah, hey, hey, Reverend, hey, Rabbi. Now we depend upon the thing, and we don't mind the buffering because my God, that means that we're alive. We're in the room. Something's happening. It's going to connect at some point. So we learn to accept the flaws of the panopticon. The flaws of the optics of the pandemics made us more attuned to our insufficiency in face of the technology and our appreciation for it. And it doesn't have to be perfect to be useful. So when we look at it that way, when we saw George, when, when white people saw George Floyd mm. on the screen, it wasn't just no regular thing. They're used to now feeling empathy for what they see on screen. So mm -hmm. ironically enough, had they seen George Floyd before the pandemic, it would have been, oh, my God, it's horrible again. But eh. but now it's been intensified. I depend upon this screen. I need the screen to talk to my kids. My God, some people need the screen to say goodbye to their loved ones. Mm -hmm. And so and so now it's precious. It's a precious medium. And so when we see George Ford as, Floyd as white people dying, black people, too. But I'm talking about white folk now. Oh my God, they got it for the first time. Many white people fell in love with black people for the first time mm. with George Floyd's death. I'm sorry, that's just what it is. Mm. So the pandemic, the, the, the movement for black lives, right? Mm -hmm. um, which, is, which is the appreciation for and empathy with uh, those black bodies that are now mediated through the screen mm. and uh, the way in which the, the, the political geography Mm. of black identity and American, you know, self-reflection, because that's what we're dealing with. Where are we located? What are we doing? How the pandemic is pushing us. So then the pandemic, <clears throat> the political scape, the police, mm. and those of us who are in the social realm, right? I don't know if I captured, you said pandemic. Oh, you got pandemic tech. You got, no, you got it, Doc. Listen, and, the black, and, the, and the technology. So, yep, it's right there. Yeah. And that's why I think it made a huge difference this time around. So we got one more question, but we have to open this up. We got to take some questions from uh, from this audience. We have two hours, right? We got two hours. Come no, on. we don't, bro. This is our this is this our is not the opening night of basketball. Come on, last question, and we're gonna open it up uh, to the audience. Uh, Roxanne and and Larry back to moderate some 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 Q and A with you. Uh -huh. I just want to read a very quick quote and ask you to speak about a couple of the different germs in the book. So every book that you write, you put some germs or gems, however you want to define it. You put some nuggets in there that are original and that challenge us to think and that, you know, they really sort of um, uh, frame your books in ways that that make each each time out such a distinct sort of uh, enterprise. And so I'm gonna read this quote and ask you about two of those, how, how two of those ideas in a long time coming shape what you're talking about this quote. Now this is on page 188 in a long time coming. This is just the, you know, the original uh, uh, version here. You say here, uh, dear Sandra, I hardly need to tell you that one of the greatest white comforts is not having to know anything about black life. And, and, and the way that I want you to respond to that quote is you provide two powerful examples of that. 
And I just want you to break these things down quickly for our audience. One is the political economy of night, mm -hmm. right? And the second is the black next versus the white again. Those are two really deep theoretical aspects of black existence that white folks don't necessarily have to know about. So what you're saying to Sandra Bullock in your epistolary address of her, you, you're exemplifying the book by giving specific nuggets, one of them being bla the black next versus the white again, and the other one being the political economy of night. So can you just break those two pieces down quickly for our, for our audience so we can then, then open it up? Yes, sir. Well, very briefly, political economy of night. I'm talking about what black people did while they were in the dark. And white folk were in the dark about black life. They didn't know. They were literally caught in the dark. They in unknown. wasn't curious, except to the degree that it reflected on their ownership of these black bodies and what they could do. So black people at night, uh, and unbeknownst to many people during slavery, in some areas, could get passes to to go fish, to go hunt, um, to go visit their loved ones, their sweetie pies. Uh, their wives, their husbands. They can live their family. lives at night. What's that? They can live their lives at night. They can live their lives at night. In fact, that's what they did. And the slave, the slave owner said, oh, look at there. Them, them Negroes are real lazy during the day, but they come alive at night. And they called it the Negro, and you know that's the other word they use, Negro daytime is the nighttime, right? That's what, well, well, guess what, slave owner? Yeah, we ain't trying to work for you. We're trying to engage in slowing down everyday forms of resistance, as James Scott would call it in the weapons of the week, anthropologically. So we're trying to slow down the work. We're trying to, you know, kill the animals that you need to help out. We're trying to break some of the tools that you need. We're trying to slow down the pace. We're doing everything we can to throw a wrench into your the machinery of uh, enslavement. But at night, you know, we came alive. And so... That political economy of night expresses the nighttime, the nocturnal ambition of black America. Mm -hmm. And so when people are dogging black people about going on at night, we've been doing this for 400 years. We've been doing this for a long time, right? It didn't just start with the clubs, didn't just start, you know, uh, kicking it uh, with our boys and girls. We've been doing that forever. Mm -hmm. And we were forced to do that, but we turned it into a virtue. We made it, a necessity became a virtue in a Kantian Transformation, so inverse proportion. So that's the political economy of night. What we next did at night, how we changed the world. Next and again, please, real quick, bro. Next and again, black next is <clears throat> the greatest word in the, in the vocabulary of black creativity and black cultural resistance to me is next. Oh, you steal our, our, our slave songs, we come up with the blues. You steal our blues, we come up with jazz. You steal jazz, we come up with, you know, R&B. You steal R&B, we come up with, or soul, you know, rock and roll. Uh, whatever you just keep stealing hip hop. I don't think they're still in hip hop. Uh, hip hop is especially resistant so far. You got a couple white guys and light lady, white ladies doing it, but for the most part, it's remained pretty black from you know, uh, run DMC to the baby. They do it. So, mm -hmm. what's interesting is that the next is not only culturally, but it's also politically. Oh, you you steal this means you you stop us here. We're gonna come back again. You know we, we're gonna we're gonna do the next form, the next iteration, the next understanding, the next imagining. Now the white dominant white culture saying no, we're gonna do it again. The stuff that worked before where we dogged you, we're gonna keep reinventing that. We're gonna do that again. Let's do it again. Let's keep hegemony going. So slavery work, let's do it again through the Confederacy. The Confederacy work, let's do it again through Jim Crow. Jim Crow work, let's do it again through separate buddy, you know, which is part of Jim Crow. But then keep on through busing, through through segregation, through resegregation. Keep again. Black next, white again. In conflict, not in conversation, trying to determine the future of this nation. And I think at best, America has done its greatest work when the black when the black next has trumped the white again. Make America great again. Michael, Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, the book is called Long Time Coming, uh, Long Time Coming, Reckoning with Race in America. I'm gonna bring back to the stage Larry Platt and Roxanne Shevlin. Wow, now 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 you uh now you understand what uh none other than Barack Obama was talking about when he said that no speaker wants to follow Michael Eric Dyson. <laughs> that's that's pretty high praise. Yeah. Um, 
Roxanne uh, should be joining me. Here we go. Uh, while we're waiting, uh, Dr. Dyson, um, uh, you in this book, you come out with uh, a, a left cross right away with an open letter to Elijah McLean that actually got me really choked up on page three. Um, and and made me start to wonder. And I was I was aware of the story. Like I was aware of of what happened to him. Mm -hmm. But I didn't I had never gotten this emotional. You humanize him in a way that journalism ought to humanize mm -hmm. subjects. And I wonder and, and it got me wondering why. And if so, if you could tell us a little bit about that and why why that story got you so emotional, but also like why that wasn't the catalyst for white awakening. Like why do Floyd and not mm. this utter um, gentle and, soul? Right. Yeah, arguably on the spectrum, arguably young Elijah McClain, 23 years old. Um, his co-worker said that he, he walked as if a gold orb surrounded him. He was a vegan. He said he wouldn't hurt a fly. He didn't eat meat. And when the police came for him, he was wearing a, a, a ski mask. This is before the pandemic. So even the person who called the cops said, look, he's probably nothing, but I'm just calling. And I wish white folk, when you think it's probably nothing, would just leave it there. Like, don't call them because you can't be responsible for the cop who will show up, who will take probably nothing and turn it into probably dangerous, probably needs to die. And if that seems hyperbolic, look at the interaction between Elijah McClain, five foot six, 140 pounds. Um, he, he said immediately, please respect the boundaries I am speaking. And he let them know I'm an unorthodox person. I'm weird. I'm not the normal guy. And your question, uh, Brother Platt, is why wouldn't he be the springboard for a, a movement of white brothers and sisters because he, he, he had removed all the excuses, right? Uh, hey, he wasn't running from the cops. He ain't big and black, so you ain't scared of that little dude. Uh, he ain't cussing them out. He's not trying to grab your gun and run, right? All the excuses, the asterisks had been removed. But I think something about the pandemic is what forced us to grapple with um, George Floyd. Mm -hmm. I think our own, you know, white America was itself vulnerable. And then they go, well, damn, you gonna do this, do a do during the pandemic? Like, like you gonna kill him during the pandemic? Like we're all jacked up, bruh. And then the screen that had mediated our identities, we're used now to being on screen. Everybody's in Snapchat. <laughs> yeah, you thought you weren't before. And all of those ways in which identity has been played with, the subjectivities of, of an agency of people on screen, online, mm -hmm. when they're putting noses and ears and making themselves through filters. Well, George Floyd's death became a filter on the Snapchat of racial reconciliation mm -hmm. and racial trauma. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the fact that he, like uh, Elijah McClain, whose story was basically buried, right? Mm -hmm. Elijah McClain is the usual trajectory of these stories until something comes along to expose it. Um, so he wasn't spectacle written as Dr. Peterson talked about it. Uh, and, and it should have been because here was a gentle, sweet soul who's, who, and, and I'll tell you what else was hard about that story is that this to me was the performance of respectability politics and its uselessness, right? Mm -hmm. The point of respectability politics is for black people to show white folk that we are good people. So we're gonna show you we're smart, we're intelligent, we're competent, we're capable. What's that? We're vegetarian, we're vegan. We're vegetarian, I don't even eat meat. Right. Uh, right. Hey, I wouldn't hurt a fly. And then, then look what he did. I understand your job, it's really tough. Look at what he had to do and look what difference it made. Not a, not a darn difference, not a darn difference. This boy, this young man was smothered. He was basically rendered unconscious twice, choke hold it, choke held twice by police who played with him, toyed with him as, as he was persona non grata, toyed with him, unconsciously 
it rendered him unconscious twice. And then when the EMT showed up, they gave him ketamine, sent him in the shock, and a week later he was dead. This is one of the most extraordinarily painful things for me to have confronted by, and I wanted to start there because I wanted to say this is the price. This ain't no scary black man. This ain't nobody you think that you should be afraid of. What's your excuse now? And I wanted to begin there and then make people rethink what they thought of George Floyd. Because George Floyd, same way. Because you know, both with George Floyd and uh, Eric Garner, any other situation, you know, the first thing, hey, you know, he's a, you did drugs. Hey, you know, he's a criminal. Right. This is Peterson's, I think, brilliant uh, made me, you know, uh, criminology of blackness. I hadn't even thought about it that way. I'm ripping it off like I always thought about. Yes, I was uh, doing a criminology of, you know, black uh, death, of course. So the thing is, is that doing a criminology, you know, standing in as a black Columbo, I'm going like, hey, you know, what's going on? Like, look what, what, what my crumpled suit and my tie and talking about Mrs. Columbo with my cigar and my jacked up car. Uh, one more question. I'm Columbo. One more question. I just want to keep getting at it. One more question. Why is it then that in this instance, George Floyd was not seen, right? All, nine times arrested, served time in prison, has not so far been successfully co-opted with that narrative. We'll see when we get to court what will happen. But that had nothing to do with the callous indifference and the easy, everyday, sadistic racial sadism that was manifest by Derek Chauvin when he dug his knee into that man's neck. I think that tapped white people in a way that said, no, no, we ain't got no more excuses. This is what it is. And now we've got to hit the streets with black people. So I think that's why McLean didn't spark off the same way that uh, George Floyd did. So let, let, let me ask this. Why, when I read about McLean at the time, I probably read a newspaper story and I thought, oh, that's terrible. Right. But I wasn't moved to tears and outrage to the degree I was when I read your letter to him. The and media didn't humanize him, Larry. The media didn't do the the, the an appropriate job of humanizing Elijah McClain because, because, and this is what Dr. Zeissen is wrestling with in the book, the spectacle of black death desensitizes the American media audience, not necessarily black America, but the American media audience to black death. Yeah. Amen. And, then, and, and not seeing this guy as your, that's your child. That's your little brother. That's Spectrum 23. Hmm. That, that's your family member. We see it that way, but a lot of white brothers and sisters didn't necessarily see him that way. And let's be honest, a lot of white folk didn't fall in love with black people and non-black people didn't fall in love with black people to George Floyd. And this is why I compare it to. I compare it to a romance. A lot of white people that day went, I I'm in love, right? They hit the streets and this was their love language. And, and, and I don't take that lightly, by the way. When white folk hit that street, the reason these are the biggest protests in the history of America is because white bodies swole those protests. And don't say it was just symbolic. Most of the people who did the dying in Black Lives Matter protests in this latest one were white. Sorry, that is what it is. That's the facts. Them's the facts, right? Now, that we know. We know black people are always dying in the background. We know brown people are always dying in the background. We know people of color are always dying in the background. Non-Americans dying in the background, rendered invisible. So I'm not denying that. That's real. But in terms of the highly visible spectacle of perishing in defense of these ideals, Antifa took the heat for trying to stoke up to, you know, the, the, the resistance, right? Right? And and right finally, they're they're catching hell. They're like, oh, welcome to our world. That's what they say about us all the time. Mm -hmm. And and now the two people who died, the two men who died in Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, those are those are excuse me for that. Uh, thought I put this on. Uh, Do not disturb those people who uh, died were two white men after Jacob Blake. Uh, was was shot in Wisconsin, and that that young seventeen year old thug, uh, terrorist, uh, white supremacist, who who Donald Trump defended. We can't wait for your corrupt white ass to leave the White House. So and take the rest of your body with you too. <laughs> So the thing is, right, of, of course, partly the fact is he mistook his anus for his mouth and 
has has proceeded out of his uh of, of, of his vocal cords ever since. But but the point is that that when we look at you know the fact that these white men died and white people put their bodies on the line, that was love language. Now, six months later, it's like it never occurred, right? A lot of black people are upset, like there's no reckoning. And I would say this, I would be careful. This is where my hope would come in. When you're in love at the first, you got love language, you got romance, you got flowers and everything. And then now it's about the, the toilet seat is up. Uh, what the hell did I almost fell in, dude? Like, put it down. Uh, are you actually rolling the toothpaste from the top and not the bottom? Uh, the toilet paper goes on the outside, not the inside. But this is where love really gets structural and systemic on the unsexy, normal, every day where you got to take the kids and kick them to school. You got to share the responsibilities of cooking. This is a theory to me. Peterson does it. I'm just theorizing because he cooks in his home. What a ridiculous man he is doing all the kind of intellectual work he does. Plus, he's doing all that stuff. He's giving people like me a bad name because I go like, oh, I'm too busy. I'm working. Yeah, right. OK, so that's where love expresses itself. And I think that now with white brothers and sisters and non-black people, here's where the unsexy everyday stuff comes in. What are you doing at your jobs? How do you don't just post a black circle on post on social media, figure out how to integrate the rhythm and rituals of corporate America in your life. Tell who's green lighting projects. Who's at your school actually kicking people out and deciding seven, eight, nine year olds are getting kicked out. Who's making the decision on your local school board to have police there. See, this is where the unsexy normal love happens. Now we still need reminders of, that love. So black and white people must have date night. So every now and again, we have Martin Luther King Jr. day coming up. That's date night, right? <laughs> like this remote. That's date night, right? So we remember and remind ourselves, oh, we got to really be intentional about our coming together. So people who are upset, no, nah, this is the natural rhythm. You can't stay on the mountain. You got to go to the valley. But while you're in the valley, be specific and particular and intentional because it will get heated up once again. Every now and again, you're going to catch a surprise. Oh, rip, rip, me? Me, baby? You, you, you got a babysitter for the kids? Oh, just me and you. So that will happen in race as well. So don't be discouraged by the fact that nothing is visibly happening. A lot happening. A lot of stuff behind the scenes is happening. And this is what we have to make sure of as we move into the future. It's only been six months, six right. months since George Floyd. So yeah. let's not like write it off like, oh, the reckoning never happened. It ain't had a chance to start yet. This is the period in which it starts. We, we only have a few minutes left. But Roxanne, why yeah. don't you? Uh, I, wanted to, yes, I wanted to ask yeah. you, and you, you touched on this a little bit with, with sort of, you know, talking about um, not being discouraged, right? And as we end this, horrible year right. um you know tell us what what makes you or you know if you are optimistic that you know 2021 and moving forward is is going to be better you know are we going to learn from this yeah i remember being in a elevator i don't know if it was me dolly Parton, and jesse jackson and another figure how about that story how about that book right there mm. and so somebody was complaining this has had to be like the early 90s Oh, what a horrible, horrible day it was. And Jesse leaned in and said, try missing one. Because mm. <laughs> that would mean <laughs> you're dead, right? <laughs> try missing one of them days, right? And yeah. so horrible year, to be sure, try missing it. There are some people who are not here. Herman Cain ain't here mm. anymore, right. right? He died, right? True. Um, so, so the point is, you're absolutely right. It has been horrible. It started with Kobe Bryant's death for many of us. And now here we are. Uh, in the back end where the trauma and tragedy of COVID has besieged us. And I'm reminded again of Reinhold Niebuhr, the great theologian who said, you know, optimism is sticking your finger in the air to see which way the wind is blowing. It's premised on a reading of the tea leaves and of what you think is likely to occur. So it's a kind of empirically based as much as that can be said to uh, be the case, yeah. but hope, even the Bible says hope against hope. I said, what the hell does that even mean, right? Hope against hope. That, that means that they, there are competitions on what that vision is, right? So, so for me, you know, when, when I hear some people say, for instance, I have hope because I, my candidate made it in. God, God came through and put Obama in. Wait a minute, if God put Obama in, that means God put in Donald Trump. 
So I'm, I'm confused here. If God had anything to do with it, so what, what happened to your God? I, I feel like Edward G. Robinson. Where's your God now? Huh? Huh? I'm, I'm, I'm giving y'all mad drama up in here. I'm, I'm, I'm dropping mad drama on you up in here. So, so the thing is, right, go see the Ten Commandments. Edward G. Robinson, huh? Huh? where's your God now? <laughs> so, so the thing is, is that if God put Obama in office, God put Trump in office. I go, God put neither of them in office. God really doesn't give a dang about who's in the office to that degree. God cons is concerned with principles. Are you just? Are you about equality? Are you about sharing your life and sacrificing your particular life for the common good? You people have to be responsible. Don't put that on God. Like God put somebody in there. God didn't pull no lever or dimple, no Chad. God is like, I'm up here chilling, watching the NBA playoffs. I'm not worried about trying to put somebody in uh, who's the president. God is not trying to micromanage the universe because that's human culpability and responsibility, at least in my theology. You can see why I ain't got no church. So my point is that God doesn't dictate who gets in. God dictates the principles that should prevail in determining who you choose to get in. And the choices we make implicate us. So I believe in hope. Hope exists even when there is no evidence that it is true. But against the evidence, against the odds, hope, the black people I come from say, you know, faith is, you know, stepping out on nothing, believing something will be there by the time you get there. And so for me, hope is the, opera opera the operationalizing of the faith you have and the belief that something good can be done. Howard Thurman, the great mystic said, Refuse to reduce your dreams to the event you're confronting because the event you're confronting cannot exhaust your possibilities. He said, our slave foreparents looked at long rows of cotton, rawhide, whip of the overseer, and all they saw was hurt and pain, but they imagined a different future. So for me, hope is imagining a different future. And Howard Thurman said the following, you can be a prisoner of hope or you can be a prisoner of events. I don't want to be a prisoner of events like the pandemic. I want to be a prisoner of hope, the possibility that after the pandemic, we will do something powerful. I hope post-pandemic humanity is so much more empathetic and loving and supportive, though I suspect that as soon as we're out, that we're going to forget what it was like, that mask wearing, that social distancing, and we're going to re relegate the untouchables to socially distanced realities through prejudice. And we're going to mask again. Paul Lawrence Dunbar said, we wear the mask. For one moment in America for about a year and a half, America got a chance to be a person of color. America got a chance to be black. They have to wear a mask and they have to stay the hell away. That's what it means to be black, is to wear masks and to be a person of color, to be Asian, to be indigenous, is to wear a mask and to be distanced from it. For that moment, I hope America remembers, when you go back to your regular stuff, this is the life, the pandemic of prejudice, of racial alienation and hostility is what we have to deal with. But I'm hopeful that the very same people who have been its greatest victims will be its greatest agents of transformation. So yes, I do maintain. Here. Dudes, mm. that, that, that is yes. the, perfect, the perfect way to, uh, let me grab my two buck Chuck here. Uh, that is the perfect way to go out. Um, uh, a rousing call for, for the, the, the prison of hope. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and, and yeah, buy that book. Uh, and, and, um, I can't thank you guys enough. Uh, and, and, you know, Roxanne, the other thing that made that, that Dr. Dyson made me think of is in this festival, we did the RIP medical debt fund, which yeah. is still going to be open till the end of the month. And that's, People can contribute. It's up to $74,000, which will cure, forgive $7.5 million of, of the hospital debt of indigent Philadelphians. And so go yeah. to the website and, we, and, and talk about hope. That, and that was really Roxanne, uh, Roxanne's doing. And that, 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 that is a, a beacon of hope, uh, inspired yeah. by the, the, the eloquence of, of, of you two dudes. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very quickly, I know we got to go, but I, my first time meeting Ms. Roxanne, extraordinary. I've heard so many extraordinary things about her. <laughs> That's the power. And then you think about a woman of color, a woman of in, in, insane intelligence with this, uh, you know, Larry Platt is a white guy, but I'm telling you with the soul 
of compassion for people who are not like him. He doesn't perform it. I've seen him do it. Mm -hmm. It ain't no theory. It ain't no ideal. Mm -hmm. So I'm telling you, here's a white man who gets it. You obviously, you obviously haven't haven't seen me dance. <laughs> uh, well, listen here, uh, you and Barack Obama can take lessons from each other. <laughs> no, <laughs> but he's a great guy. He can't yeah. collect me with his yeah. humor. He's a white man who's committed to doing the right thing. And in this day and age, I got to elevate and celebrate that. A special thank you to our sponsors.